Good morning, everybody. Thank you all so much for coming this morning. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce my partner of uh, almost 20 years now, Sandak Ruit. And medicine is really a bastion for risk averse overachievers and people who fall into a, a small safe zone and try and stay with it. And there are just a few innovators I've had the privilege of meeting in my life who always strive to do better, who think, how can we do something a little bit better? How can we change things? How can we improve things? And there are also just a few people I've met in my life who really look at the world in a large perspective, from all different religious perspectives, philosophic perspectives, and think, how can I make our world a better place? And to have that combination of the philosophic thought of how can I make our world a better place and never being satisfied that what I'm doing now is good enough. I can do something better. How can we make things better? How can we improve our world? And of anyone I've ever met at any university, any place, anyone in medicine, there's no one I've met who's changed our world more than the person I'm very, very proud to introduce, Sandra Kruit. There's you know, uh, Govind Dapa Venkantan Swami, the uh, founder of Aravind Eye Hospital. There's maybe Nag Rao in Hyderabad. But next to that, there's no one in the world of international medicine that I can think of that has changed our world the way Sandak Ruit has. And it's a, a great honor for me to have Professor Dr. Sandak Ruit from Nepal here with us this morning. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you very much, Jeff. And uh, Jeff, uh, as he had pointed out, we have uh, now together been working for almost a little more than 25 years uh, in this uh, wonderful uh, uh, journey that we had, you know. And uh, this morning, I'd like to uh, say a very nice good morning to this wonderful group of people here at the Moran's Eye Center, some faculty members, some managers, some residents, some students. And uh, you know, quite a few of you have come and visited us in Nepal. And uh, we take great pride in saying in Nepal and elsewhere that we have a very great uh, collaboration with the University of Utah Moran's Eye Center. And this morning, I'd like to take you and show you uh, some of the works that we started bit by bit in the early phases and how we have come and mostly on cataract surgery. And uh, our deal right from the beginning has been how could we provide <coughs> the state of the art cataract surgery to the community in a country like Nepal and elsewhere. Now, if you look at uh, the cataract blindness worldwide, you know, we don't really have a, the World Health Organization doesn't have, you know, specific data, but we have some data <laughs> which are available to us. And according to these data, We believe that about 18 million people of the 39, peop uh, 39 million are blind with cataract. So almost 50% of the, of the blinds are mostly with cataract. And if you look at the other category of visually impaired with cataract, if you take 660, which is 20 by, 20, 20 by 200, then the number of uh, you know, visually impaired with cataract becomes about a little more than three times. And if you take it with 618, it becomes a little more than eight times. So it's very important for me to let you know that this category of uh, visually impaired with cataract uh, is important because most of the surgeries done globally right now are on these patients, not so much on these patients. So I always say that the real blind cataract patients are cocooned 
by patients who are seeing better. So these patients who are outside sick surgical uh, services and we who can provide them surgical services, take a emulsification. We become so good now that we tend to take up patients with little cataracts. And we know this is very, it's very predictable. So a lot of these patients get surgery quite early. But again, you know, the, the ones who are really blind really gets uh, stayed away. And uh, some of the reasons uh, for these blind patients to stay away is uh, with the severe advanced cataract is because they are deprived socially and economically and uh, because it's very difficult to reach them through transportation and other amenities. And again, I say it's you know, cocooned. Now, it is estimated that globally in 2011, about, again, we don't have specific data, but I may be correct, one million plus and minus, that we have about 33 million surgeries per year, globally, yeah. But unfortunately, the iniquity is so much that in some country, you have the luxury of having about 8,000 cataract surgical rates per year per million population. But there are some countries in the world, in the same world, where the CSR is less than 500. And we still have lots of large countries where the CSR is less than 500. And about 33% of the countries have CSR less than 1,000. And just about 6% has more than 4,000. Of course, this is increasing now. And uh, I try to uh, get into this figure and uh, uh, let you know, let you present this. And if you look at this is the number of people who are blind with cataract. And these are the category of pa patients who are visually impaired, but operable cataracts. And since the 23 million of people who are doing globally surgery, most of the patients fall in this category. You know, and we have done only 23 million, so we're still left with 120, 21 million per year to do surgery if we continue to operate like this. I hope I'm making my point clear, you know. See, if 18 million is the one which is truly blind, and then there are categories of cataracts with visual impairment, not so mature, but in this category of vision, and uh, as you know, that in most of developed countries and a lot of urban, urban cities and developing countries, most of the cataracts done are in this category, you know, because now we are able to do it because the results are so predictable. And that's why I think if we continue to do like this, then I believe we still have about 121 million to do every year. We need to do more surgery. And uh, this is to look at the challenges of cat doing cataract surgery in a community, particularly in developing country. And uh, I'm looking at the broad challenges. And again, inequity in terms of quantity. In terms of quality, there are only very few countries where intracat is being done now, fortunately. Intracat almost now going away uh, from most of the countries. But still, planned extra cap with sutures are done quite in many places of the world. And a lot of small incision surgery is coming up. And of course, FACO. So there's a, you know, so much uh, in quality. But uh, it's again important that you address the cataract blind. And uh, as I said, the magnitude of the operable cataract must be much higher. And there are geographical challenges and there are government and bureaucratic challenges. People, you know, like Jeff, me, and Alan, and many of your friends, you know, Hoffman and Bob is there. We all face this problem when we go to work in other countries. And uh, I've, although I put it down here, the government and bureaucratic, but it's a very important challenge that we face when we go and do uh, charity work. Now trying to uh, limit the challenges a little bit more specifically to the cataract surgery, yeah. Now, working conditions are different. And the 
suboptimal. The microscope may not be like you want. The surgical instruments may not be like you want. The power supply may not be like you want. There are many other things. And of course, the very important thing is team. Team is so important. And team building is so important for work in our part of the world. And finding cataracts in its various stages, from early immature PSCC to very advanced in different types of cataracts and mat different maturity cataracts. And again, equipment and instrumentation, and then the large volume of cases that you have to encounter. So these are more specific challenges we face. Yeah. And uh, this is something that I like to uh, particularly have our young uh, future ophthalmologists to look at, something that I had my in my mind, you know. We started from here with actually micro incision. If you look, if many of you, some of you who know about couching, couching is actually a micro incision. We just put a small nick there and then push the lens backwards. You don't need to give stitches and it's so small. It's probably about less than one millimeter. So we started with couching with micro incision and we were quite happy to have a vision of finger counting. So that was uh, many years ago, you know, in uh, the early 19th century and late 18th century. And then you had different forms of planned, you know, different forms of crude extra caps, the Deville's linear expression and uh, extra caps where we went in with a forcep like this and, and, you know, and bite the anterior capsule and takes the material out, but still a lot of things are left behind, you know? The eye is very strongly reacting. And then after extra cap, with the problems with the extra cap, people shifted to intra caps. And because intra caps, you take the lens out, there isn't much reaction. Those days there were no microscopes. People are either operating with bare eyes or with simple loops. So it was Harold Ridley, who I think uh, was still, uh, you know, he, he was, I think he was uh, practicing in St. Thomas's Hospital, isn't it, Alan? Yeah. yeah. And uh, he got this idea from a resident who was watching his surgery from the back when he did an intercap surgery. Once he took out the lens and the resident asked him, so are you not going to put another lens back? So that's how he got the idea of putting in an intraocular lens. And of course, the rest is history. And, uh, but that time, they were using very large discoid lenses. And the extra cap was very crude, still being done with loops and left behind a lot of cortex, a lot of other materials. So, you know, uh, he, he faced his own challenges in the beginning among colleagues and other place, other people. Then slowly, uh, people started doing intercaps and anterior chamber lenses and iris fixated lenses. And uh, the scene actually shifted for a sh short time from England to Netherlands, where C.D. Binkhoff started doing the, uh, the wonderful iris clip lenses. And, uh, and then from intercap, again, went into finer extra caps, and uh, then came to safes. And I think Shearing started the, uh, the first posterior chamber lenses. Uh, and uh, about that time, a little bit later, you know, Blumenthal was starting his small incision surgery, office space, using the anterior chamber maintainer in Israel. Yeah, a little bit later. But about the same time, or a little bit earlier, Kelman was using his phaco emulsification. And, uh, the machine was very big. There were a lot of problems, but there was a wonderful idea. And uh, so the machine was put aside and we moved ahead. The machine didn't work for five, six, seven years. And that's how things sort of you know, come forward. And then we had a challenge of taking the extra cap IOL into communities in the countries like Nepal, where I'll uh, tell you a little bit later. And then we started 
modifying the small incision surgery to suit for non-office and community in large number of patients and hundreds and thousands of patients, how could we do this in a more efficient way? And of course you had, you know, then fine-tuned sacral emulsification and uh, became a standard surgery for a cataract in the West. Yeah. And then now coming back to rollable lens and microincision, you say again. So you finally started with microincision, you are back to microincision. And uh, that's what I, you know, I, I like to call it the movement backwards to forwards. Now, cataract surgical techniques, the simple extra caps, IOLs with suture, it is safe, but there are better options available now. And FACO, it is very safe, great outcome, training and text and cost complexity is still there. Although the cost complexity is getting better and training is also getting better. Manual small incision cataract surgery, more refined, modern version. It's safe, cost effective, great outcome, but training complexity. This is how we started way back in mid 80s or late 80s when you had, uh, you were doing sutured extra caps in this part of the world and you were taking about 45 minutes per case and using the big disposable sets. And uh, we were trying to find out appropriate microscopes, appropriate techniques to use in a large volume of patients. And this is actually a laboratory microscope which has been uh, sort of you know, put together and uh, gives a pseudo coaxial. And we started putting in a lot of secondary light sources from other parts, you know, so that you could see the uh, red reflects a little bit better. And sometimes you could not see the red reflects, so you have to turn the eyeball around to see the red reflects properly. So that's how we started many years ago. And uh, this is starting with a little better version of Conan microscope. Now Conan has stopped producing microscopes and uh, we uh, wanted to develop a simple effective technique where we could do cost effectively very good quality surgery in that part of the world. So we started working in the bush to develop the system. And this is actually operating in a in a veterinary clinic up in the mountains. And uh, the person who is assisting me is now one of our senior managers. And Naveen, and most of, uh, some of you may have traveled to Nepal, you probably know him. So, so that's uh, the extra caps we used to, we were operating with bare hands those days, you know, no gloves. And then we had to wash the intraocular lens uh, those days because we were worried about uh, the ethylene, oxi uh, ethylene oxide toxicity and residues on the lens, but we don't have to do that now. So we had to wash that. Now, so finally, uh, uh, you know, it took us nearly five years. We simplified, adapted, and tested, and, uh, uh, and then started uh, uh, taking the system globally and through a standard operating procedures, the Fred Hollow Foundation and Nimal and Capac project uh, under their platform, we took it around the world. You can see how several nurses uh, stay in the station. The we started uh, in 1994 uh, ambulatory surgery and we believe this was one of the first setups in the developing country to start ambulatory surgery. And, uh, we, and then we uh, you know, got the idea of cost recovery where the cost was subsidized through trust subsidy and uh, surgical modification on a production line approach. And again, I was, I was talking about geographical challenges. You know, these are the, uh, some of the places that we need to and team is very important. Building team is so important if you're working in, uh, in a country like ours and many other countries in the world. And team again, you know, 
is interesting because <laughs> this is a, a patient with a 90 degree kyphosis and we're trying to operate uh, the patient on the microscope and uh, one of the ways we found it's effective is lifting the patient's leg up uh, for some time till we finish the surgeries and uh, but I'm just trying to say that teamwork is so important yeah this is again team you know a lot of our team members are you know used in different uh, uh and again number I said number because the number of patients we have to do is really large numbers and logistics you know logistics of uh, of electrical supply logistics of surgical instruments logistics of medical consumables and quality medical consumables and of course cataracts you know you face cataracts like this uh, and uh, then sometimes and even this you know and look at this this is a this is a brown cataract and uh, I call this as a segment nucleus. <laughs> yeah, you have a very large anterior posterior diameter, and uh, you try to do a FACO, and you really land up in problem in these cases. And uh, like I was doing a big surgical workshop in Indonesia uh, recently, and uh, we found uh, nearly three fourths of the cases who were coming to the table were uh, very mature, ca mature cataracts. You can see. Uh, why an alternate to FACO is necessary. You know, I, I think using a FACO for in a in a, um, in a case like that is really difficult. Now, my, uh, I believe cataract surgical delivery system, I said right now, now we're coming from, uh, you know, cataract surgery to make it into a system, which is very important. And uh, because when we are delivering cataract surgery in the developing country, it has to be a system. There are so many things that we need to consider. <coughs> it has to be safe and technically straightforward, rapid and sustained visual outcome with very low complications, and should be able to address all stages of cataract, incorporate in a high volume ambulatory setup if ne needed be, and has to be cost effective and address a very large target group. It's very important because your target group is very large. Now I'll just, um, I'm sure you've seen this, uh, uh, this uh, video before, but I'll, uh, I'll go through the technique a little bit. Is that open like that?
Portuguese uh, uh,
look at the anatomy of the anterior capsule where you have done a capsulectomy and uh, the, the, the triangle, the apex of the triangle here, see? Yeah. Now that's the production line approach that I was talking about. And uh, now let me uh, explain to you a, a little bit length, uh, different steps of the surgery. And uh, you know, the, the most important thing, of course every step is important, but uh, the wound construction is very important and uh, capsulotomy, nucleus delivery, lens implantation, and capsulectomy finally. The wound construction, again, you know, the external and the internal openings are two different planes. And it's important, you know, uh, when you become really good, you can, uh, uh, you know, sort of manage between the two, but sometimes if you go, and in some of the nucleuses, you may have to go as much as 10 millimeters. And uh, it has to be of smooth bed and uniform width internal opening larger than the external opening. And uh, the anterior capsulotomy I was talking about, it's generally done in closed chamber. So all types of cataracts can be addressed with this. Nucleus delineation and easy delivery. And there is very little pressure on the, uh, the pressure on the capsule joinules. And uh, some people fear of this tearing out. It doesn't happen if you do it properly. The nucleus management has to be done in two steps delineation of the section of delivery to the anterior chamber, final nucleus delivery, and we use a um, uh, corrugated Simco cannula with a 21 Gauss infusion. Can infusion. <coughs> this is the table. And uh, this is, uh, you know, some of uh, our, we did an early study on looking at temporal section and at superior section. We found that about 50% of the patients had an uncorrected vision of 618 or better with the superior, while with the Temporal section, about 82% had better than 618 uncorrected vision. And uh, again, the uncorrected vision with the superior and temporal section here. And uh, this is the same patient having uh, a superior section in the right eye and a temporal section in the left eye. See, in the same person having so much of against the rule of stigmatism. Another person having uh, temporal, uh, having a superior and a temporal section. And, uh, so finally, we did a randomized clinical trial comparing uh, small incision surgery with modern TACO, and uh, we found the visual results were comparable. And uh, of course, a lot of, you know, there are individual surgeons who can do a lot of number of cases, but uh, generally we would say that few surgeons can do about 150 cases per day but we have surgeons in Nepal who does more than 200 cases a day, of course, a younger group of people, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uncorrected visual activity in week six, following the visual outcome of clinical uh, trial that uh, Jeff, Dr. David, and we did. And uh, you see uh, uncorrected visual activity week six, month six, one year and corrected visual activity one year. Now, uh, just to tell you a little bit about Tilganga, and uh, the institute has actually a uh, intraocular lens manufacturing facility, has a clinical hospital, and a very strong community outreach uh, program, and an eye bank. We also have academics in training and research. And this is uh, actually some of the uh, surgical demonstration on a 3D uh, video provided to us by Dr. David Chang, isn't it, Jeff? Yeah. Yeah. And this is the intraocular lens manufacturing facility and which manufactures uh, single piece PMMA and uh, uh, hydrophilic uh, acrylic lenses and also uh, capsule attention rings. These are single piece lenses. We have till now distributed uh, close to about 4.5 million lenses uh, in over 80 countries. This is our outreach program. The eye bank. The cornea retrieval area is at the crematorium. This is uh, an, an interesting thing about our eye bank. This is just next to the crematorium that uh, they get retrieve the cornea. And these are community eye centers that we, we have established also in Kathmandu and uh, one hospital, community eye hospital where 
And uh, if you look at uh, this, here's the total number of patients uh, going up. And our target in the next two is to take it to 0.5 million per year. And this is the surgery flow. Our target is to take it to 30,000. Yeah. And then again, there are different types of subspecialty surgeries. And uh, I just wanted to uh, share with you that temporal section, small incision manual is great, but still training is not easy, not that easy. And uh, if you look at the causes of blindness comparing Nepal in 1981 and 2010, you'll find that the cataract is actually becoming less now. And there are other diseases which are coming out. And interestingly, the blindness prevalence in Nepal has halved in the last 20 years, from 0 0.84 uh, prevalence rate to 0 0.39. Now we are trying to address visual impairment rather than blindness now. This is the total number of cataracts done in uh, 1990 and uh, 2000 and 2010. You can see how it has increased for a population increment. And our CSR has increased from about 1,500 to a capacity CSR of 7,500. Here, a lot of patients are from India, of course, yeah. For Nepalese patients, CSR would be about 3,500, I think. And you can see that the small incision surgery is you know, coming down, and I think it's going to stay around that, but uh, small incision surgery has been the main straight you know, factor for uh, 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 keeping up the cataract surgical volume. And now FACO is coming up. FACO uh, with foldable lenses is great, but cost, training, and equipment, I think all the, all the things we need to consider. And uh, Jeff has been really instrumental in taking Hilganga to the label uh, we have right now. And through him, through our partnership with uh, the Moran's Eye Center, uh, we have been able to establish subspecialty facilities in, uh, in, in, in Nepal. And uh, it has been a working, a fantastic working relationship with the Moran's Eye Center on a win-win basis. And uh, uh, Jeff and I have some great plans in the future, and I'm sure we'll sit down and discuss more about it. But uh, we, we have, of course, we face challenges, but we are excited about some of the things that we are getting through. And this is the great team that we have back in Nepal. And uh, I don't know, I don't think we can work without such a wonderful team. And uh, that's uh, Dr. Rita. Uh, she's now officiating back in the center. And uh, the team is, you know, I, I just wanted to let you know that the team is so important. Yeah. Now, just, just a viewpoint that I have about FACO is, uh, you know, uh, uh, FACO is going to come, definitely, but low cost and good quality. It has to be user-friendly machine, lower consumable cost, intensive and standardized training programs, and it has to be able to address large target group. How are we going to do that? Still, diff I mean, you know, it may finally land up to a level that it's like a laptop, you know, but I don't know. I don't know. I think something's going to come, really. Yeah. Now, uh, what I really wanted to share with you is uh, what's What's really important is the safety for the patient. The patient's safety is so important, and whether what technique you use, it doesn't matter. This is a very short video that Jeff and I have here. Well, we're getting this, this done. I want to thank everyone for coming. I know a lot of people have clinical responsibilities starting about now. If anyone wants to stay and watch the final videos, I'm definitely it's just two minutes. to answer some questions. Two minutes. Yeah. Oh, why? Yeah. I thought it's uh, And Professor Lee will be here for a few days if anyone has <laughs> personal <laughs> questions. And we have mm. our, uh, no. a big party on uh, Saturday night at Snowbird. 
I think the, the, the most important thing for doing surgery in a setup like this is the safety for the patients. Yeah. Yeah. I'll go forward. Mm. Don't worry. Mm. Will you come? No. Yeah. Let me have the last slide then. Last slide. That's it. Yeah. That's it, isn't it? You can't find anyone. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. like this. Good. Can I can I remove this now? Yes, that's fine to do with me. Thank you.